I'm Captain Kirk. Fascinating. I'm a doctor, not a mechanic. Thank you, thank you. Love you. Mwah. Most illogical. I saw it. Well, that was different. Yep, rousy, but different. Places, please. And here we go. Welcome, ladies, gentlemen, bears, Cardassians, and things to episode five of the Muppet Trek podcast. I'm Steve. And I'm Jarman, and we are here to compare, contrast, and confer about our two favorite franchises. And what are those, Steve? That would be The Muppets and Star Trek. We are going to be doing one-to-one reviews of The Muppet Show and Star Trek, the original series. What a weird idea. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we got this week? Well, in this week, we have uh, The Muppet Show with special guest Ruth Buzzy and the original series episode, The Enemy Within. Ooh. And I have to admit, I had not heard of Ruth Buzzy before. This is our first guest who I was like completely in the dark about. Well, good, because I've got some context for you. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> uh, Ruth Buzzy uh, started acting and performing at a really young age uh, and started performing regularly at 19, uh, starring in off-Broadway musical reviews and plays. She broke over into television in the mid-60s with uh, a bunch of small roles and one or two episode art kind of deals. But she really got her big start as a show regular for Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In. Everyone's heard of Laugh-In. She is the only ensemble player from that that was in every single episode from 1967 to 1973. Wow. And she is still alive and kicking at 83 years old. She is. Uh, afterwards, she went on to do a bunch of other projects. She starred in a space comedy show called The Lost Saucer. Huh. which also starred in Jim Neighbors, who hosted the last episode oh, of the show we reviewed. Go figure. But what uh, our generation would probably know her from, uh, she did tons of regular voice work, Alvin and the Chipmunks, Pound Puppies, a ton of others. She was a regular player on Sesame Street from 93 to 99, playing Ruthie, hmm. uh, and an animated character that was used until sometime in the mid-2000 named Susie Kabluzi. Oh, animated character on the Sesame Street? Yeah, but she was also herself. She played Miss Ruthie or Ruthie, and she was basically herself. Huh. Didn't know that. It was like one of the adult players. So she's had a storied history with the Henson Company. Oh, she definitely has. But at the time, she was, she'd just gotten off at Laugh-In and done all these other small roles and stuff, and she was kind of really right at her height gotcha. in this era that we get to see her. So people at the time would have known exactly who she was. Oh, yeah, of course. Gotcha. So this episode of The Muppet Show. Of course, we start with an opening number, Sunny. It's sung by the Electric Mayhem. Animal decides that this song isn't fast enough, and every single verse gets faster and faster and faster until at the end they are at an absolute fever pitch. <laughs> then we get the backstage plot. Scooter's uncle wants to replace Kermit with a wind-up impersonator. So a wind up Kermit who promptly shoves Kermit into a box <laughs> afterward. We're at the dance, a blue frackle. Most of the jokes are around the fact that he has three legs and in the end he shows all three legs, but lands on his butt. Uh -huh. <laughs> Next Kermit and his mechano doppelganger have a great scene where they have to match each other's movements in a mirror. Oh yeah. And it was super fun to watch. Super fun to watch. So well done. Uh, at this point, we get Wayne and Wanda singing row, row, row. They get much further into the song than they would typically before something goes wrong. But then, of course, the boat sings, sinks and something goes wrong. Following this is a Muppet News Flash. The Atlantic Ocean has been kidnapped and the ransom is a few weird things that feel like a time, like a timely topical joke. Two Christmases each year and hugs for mommy and daddy. I could not find any reference to what the heck that was about. It's like something to do with a uh, divorce and like remarriage, but I don't know why that has to do right. with <laughs> it. It was strange. It has to be a reference. Something I could not find anything. <laughs> well, you tried. <laughs> Finally, we get our first taste of Ruth Buzzy. She does. Can't take my eyes off of you with Sweetums where she keeps bothering and pestering him. And eventually he fights back and they get into a big brawl. It seems to be a theme. I was going to say that like last Several episodes that are hosting a female, it's always them attacking men in a bar or somewhere. There have only been five episodes so far, and three of them 
have featured physical altercations with big life-size like monsters with the female guest star yeah with the female guest star it's out of three out of five at this point it's kind of odd <laughs> it definitely is Following that, Ralph the dog sings a musical number called I Never Harmed an Onion, and it is just lots and lots of back-to-back food-based puns. And he's basically saying, I never harmed an onion. Why does it make me cry? And it's, it's, it's cute. Uh, next is a talk spot. Ruth talks about her eating habits and how she's super healthy and her hatred of fat and her extreme diet, and then ends with Ruth and Kermit talking about what tickles them just Ruth tickling Kermit off the stage and over the back wall. And it has some lovely fat shaming jokes. And then, uh, some, yeah. she, she mentions organic foods, which I was not aware organic foods was even a thing in the seventies. So that was interesting. That was a, a mm. moment for my brain. Uh, followed by this is Fozzie who goes out to do his act, but the jokes on him when he ends up basically playing the straight man to Statler and Waldorf who are actually telling the jokes. Mm hmm. Ruth then plays a prisoner of war, which was a really dark premise for a sketch uh, who gives over information to to an enemy army. But then she gets way too into detail and talks about the commander's daughter and his references. And it, it gets funny and cute at the end, but it's a little strange up front. Well, I love actually it made me laugh because the first part of it, they say we have ways of making you talk. And then later on the ep- in the <laughs> sketch, they're like, we have ways of making you stop talking. <laughs> oh, that was cute. Uh, after this, we get our final backstage moment. Kermit rejects Piggy's advances. She goes into his dressing room and finds Robo Kermit, who is more than happy to flirt with her and whispers terrible things in her ear. The real Kermit shows up, but Piggy is offended and kicks his butt instead of Robo Kermit. And would this be the first ever in history of Muppets, the first hiya from Miss Piggy? I feel like there was another one, maybe in the Sandy Duncan episode. Okay. Because I was going to say, I seemed like one of the first, at least. It's definitely one of the first. I can definitely say that. <laughs> Suddenly, talking houses, it's lame as always. Someone's son is turning into a monastery. No one laughs. <laughs> the final musical number is the Go Go La La Jub- uh, Jubilee Jug Band. You can't roller skate in a buffalo herd. It's a cute little number. Uh, The show concludes with a panel discussion where they discuss is the human body obsolete. Buzzy plays a health nut and Sam the Eagle is forced to confront his fear of both yoga and yogurt. (laughs) Finally, we get our sign off with Meccano Kermit glitching out the real Kermit thanking her and all the Muppets coming in and tickling her. How adorable. End of episode. Oh, so you mentioned the jug band, and that reminded me we do have some feedback from our YouTube uh, channel from some kind of Garf, our very much seems like a a, a Muppet expert here as well. Um, so from our last episode, it says, I feel your pain about Dog Eat Dog. That was a song we had last episode where it was kind of boring yeah, and not very it just interesting. didn't quite hit right. Uh, and and dog, some kind of Garf says, uh, they used so many songs that were obscure even back then and are barely documented as having existed today, uh, supposedly written by Edward Kastner who went on to be mm. a big shot music rights mogul, notably owned Rock Around the Clock. That's his guy. Oh, uh, Lubbock Lou cool. and his Jug Huggers were the new Jug band in season two <laughs> onwards. But honestly, I prefer uh, Go Go La La just for their performance of Does Your Chewing Gum Lose Its Flavor on the Bedpost Overnight later this season. Uh, mm. And he says, guessing it was just a slip of the tongue. You mean Mel, Mr. Bugs Bunny. Blonde. Yes, I was literally about to say, and I have to say a redaction. Oh, and here's the worst part. Yeah. So I said, Roger Rabbit. I chose the wrong alliterated name, Rabbit. I didn't realize you said I, Roger Rabbit. I would have corrected you last episode. As soon as I, as I heard it on the recording, I kicked myself. I didn't even realize. And, and the worst part is, I looked at my notes. I even had Bugs Bunny written down. <laughs> and I so still funny. said Roger Rabbit. Some kind of Garf, you are absolutely right. I was about to redact that statement. Thank you for calling me on it. Keep calling me on it. And keep giving us more great details that I couldn't find anywhere. Yeah, he says, sorry about the wall of text. I have too many Muppet opinions. I keep said, it coming. I said, don't apologize for the opinions. We love talking about them. We'll respond to this text next week's show. Uh, uh, yeah, so that was a lot of fun. Thanks, Garf. And keep responding. We love it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, please. I was about to redact it. I felt like such a fool. You're absolutely right. I didn't right. realize you said that. Otherwise, I would have said something. <laughs> Bugs Bunny, Mel Blank. Oh, my gosh. That's funny. All right. So that's the episode. Yeah, that's the episode. Uh, so let's talk about the music for this episode. All right. 
because I realized I was talking more and more about the music because it's such a big part of the show. It is. It really is. Uh, so the song Sunny they open up with, I actually didn't recognize. And Anna kind of looked at me like I had a fork in my head. Uh, it's written by a guy named Bobby Hebb, and it was written in the two days following November 22nd, 1963. On the same day, there was the assassination of JFK mm. and Bobby Hebb lost his older brother and performing partner, Harold. Uh, and he wrote this song basically as a tribute to finding a sunny disposition in all of it. I've heard this song uh, was, for years. Yeah. I, and I, you know, once I heard it, I went, oh yeah, I guess I know that song, but I didn't recognize it on the show. Oh. It was released in 66 and it's one of the most covered songs of all time with more than a hundred released versions. Really? I would with, not have known that. From, from artists ranging everywhere from Cher, Stevie Wonder, and Frank Sinatra. Huh. Uh, row, 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 the Wayne and Wanda number, written by a guy named James Monaco. He was a popular Broadway review writer in the early 1900s, and uh, it was featured in a 1912 review called Zigfield Follies. <laughs> God. Uh, I never heard an onion uh, from a performer and songman host of tonight, Steve Allen. Ah. Uh, the reason this is important, Sam and friends, which was Jim's first show ran in a five minute time slot, two times a day. One of them was before a popular news program. And the other one was from 1125 to 1130 at night, immediately before tonight with Steve Allen huh. and Jane Henson uh, in one of the books credits this time slot with the early success of Sam and friends and their popularity because not only was uh, Steve, uh, Steve Allen extremely popular, it was the exact demographic they were aiming for. Mm. Uh, and so it was just right place and right time for Sam and friends. And it's so weird to, to this day, late night shows start at 1135. They don't start 1130. Hmm. They start 1135, like late night, Col uh, Stephen Colbert show. And uh, oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah. Interesting. And usually local news just co covers that five extra minutes or whatever in between 1130, 1135. Mm, I guess that makes sense. It's just weird. So it it fit perfectly to have like a five minute puppet show, you know, in between that time. Uh, and then you can't roller skate in a Buffalo herd uh, written by Roger Miller, who actually later hosts the show in season three. Oh, well, there you go. But he was kind of like a comedian gag song writer. Kind of like a weird Al Yankovic of his time. Kind of, but not parodies, just weird songs. Like Ray Stevens, maybe. Like his most popular song is called Do Whack a Do. <laughs> so just, you know, just for context. <laughs> that would fly really well these days. People will love that it kind would. of stuff. It would. <laughs> so, Jarman, what did you think about The Muppet Show with special host Ruth Buzzy this week? Um, it was at first kind of just like um going by, wasn't laughing, wasn't really um having the greatest of times, but then had some really just great, you know, fun moments. Um, I like the whole wind up Kermit thing. That was a lot of fun. And just, I was amazed. At, I, I stopped suddenly and was just captivated by the mirror sequence with the two, the two Kermits. Uh, this is a bit that was perfected in duck soup with the Marx brothers, but then was also kind of recreated in Muppets most wanted where Kermit and Constantine face ah. off in a broken mirror and have to like match each other's movements. So That's it's, right. it's a fun, call back and call forward well the weird part was just it was so perfect at first that i thought there was actually a mirror there and suddenly it started moving it's like wow that was really good puppetry work with two, two different puppeteers just spectacular very perfectly um which sounds small and also i want to ask you who is yeah. usually in the sweetums costume um so originally Sweden's three guys out there is a big, the big puppet that has a big, you know, furry head and everything. Uh, it's a originally, I believe it was Jerry Nelson mm -hmm. who only did it for, I think one or two times before he gave it up. And then Richard Hunt took over and I, Richard Hunt does the voice of Sweden's and I believe he did the body of it. Gotcha. Cause that dance number where she's time. beating the hell out of him and she loves him. Uh, he does some good dance moves in there a little bit. So I was like, who's in that costume? He's pretty good. That being said, and for dance numbers also, and I can't speak specifically for this, they had uh, a lot of uh, ballerinas and uh, like jazz dancers and stuff that they brought in for more complex dance numbers, especially with the, the full size body puppets. Gotcha. Um, so it could have been one of those, but it was definitely that was definitely Richard Hunt singing. Yeah, that's definitely his voice. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm realizing with this episode is kind of 
leading me to realize even more that I'm I love the ongoing Fozzie and um, Sattler and Waldorf bits. Um, I like. Oh, yeah. The rivalry. It's great. Yeah. Because like the jokes are cheesy, but just the rivalry is just fun. It's like comforting. Like I know it's going to happen every episode now. And I'm like, oh, that's I like it. I like this part of the show. Like it's my favorite part of the show now when it comes up. And I I do also (laughs) miss uh, the uh, veterinarian gag. So I hope those veterinarian hospital. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm hoping that comes back soon. I mean, we're we're going to come out to a point in the show where it becomes one of the staples and one of the most popular where it's in every episode, every gotcha. other episode. Also, as the show progresses, season two, season three, you're going to see a lot more repeating gags mm-hmm. um, and repeating characters. Of course, they had to have and time ca- to figure out that they were working. Right. And that, and that also came with the popularity of certain characters. Like really, Veterinarian's Hospital, the popularity of Piggy and then Ralph was really what what sealed that in. Uh, same thing with uh, Swine Trek, the Star Trek ripoff that Uh-oh. we'll eventually get to. I'm excited. A to see lot that. of that was based off of uh, not only the the pop post popularity of Star uh, Star Trek, but also Miss Piggy. And how well that ties into our show po- premise. <laughs> yes, eventually. That's yes. amazing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and then I just um, there was a lot of. Uh, Good funny moments from our Ruth Buzzy. She did a lot of good stuff in here. Um, just it, it, it didn't feature her enough. I noticed that it was eight minutes into the episode before she it was, was even in a- so long before she got on the yeah. freaking screen. So that was that's odd. The reason when I when I recapped, I said finally we get our yes. first taste of Ruth Buzzy. So that was the only downfall of this episode. I feel like they could have brought her in earlier. Um, if she had, they had featured her as much as they had featured Jim Neighbors, like in the last episode, it would have been a little better. Um, but because she's actually really funny. And she did a lot of funny um, physical gags and the dance number and stuff. So, like, they could have used her more. Um, yeah, I feel nice. like they didn't know what to do with her, maybe. Because even the talk spot was was long for a talk spot. Like, they were filling time. Yeah, and she was like, and they did the thing again where she abuses Kermit. Like, everyone seems to do in these talk spots. They just, like, whack him in the face and stuff. It's like, can they stop doing that? <laughs> but um, and, and something that they do in later episodes and you see it much more clearly with later guests that I don't think they were doing quite at this point is they would basically ask the guests like what do you want to do yeah they can do that in Saturday Night Live as well I've heard behind the scenes they ask they first question right. is asked, what do you want to do what are you is good there at? a talent that you want to show off that isn't right. what you do so like are they a singer who's known for singing but they also can tap dance and she was a good singer of this episode too she really was I mean she she was on on and off Broadway throughout her career so she she was trained she knew it. Yeah. I'm glad I got to know Ruth Buzzy in this episode. Yeah. A, a, a fun episode. But once again, all these episodes just make me yearn for later this season and then season two, three, when they really have their stuff together. Once they get their sea legs. Yeah. Like, there's stuff yeah. There. And you can really feel it and it feels great. This just all makes me want that. Yeah. And the same thing for me. Like I know season two is like the most pretty much the most solid of Star Trek uh, season three gets off the rails a bit, but which we'll get to eventually. But season two is definitely like the, the solid. They have the cast. They know their f- formula. They know what people like. And it's just it, it gets really solid. So we'll both get there in season two. It'll be fun. Yeah, I think both shows are maturing. And that's kind of fun to see on both sides of the coin. It is. This is it's interesting. So not a bad episode. Not a bad episode. So, Jarman, let's talk about the also not a bad episode of the original series. Oh, yeah. So I'm glad you think so already. The Enemy Within. So. While on a geological expedition to planet Alpha 177, you don't need to remember that because it's not important. <laughs> um, <laughs> one of the technicians there falls off one of the mountains a little bit. He gets injured. He has um, ore and uh, like geological material all over him, but he is transported back to the Enterprise to be healed. And Scotty has some trouble transporting him back aboard, uh, but he finally gets under control. Uh, Scotty figures out that some of the ore samples that were on the technician kind of screwed with the transporter and made it kind of messed up. So then Captain Kirk transports back to the ship and appears to be just fine. Uh, But Kirk is disoriented. He's falling over. He's a little dizzy. So Scotty escorts him back to his quarters, leaving the transporter room empty, where suddenly a second Kirk transports into the transporter room and he's sweaty and has eyeliner. So that means something bad is happening. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, yes, that is typically the sign of something (laughs) bad happening. As long as you don't have a goatee, you might as well have to be sweaty with eyeliner to show that you're evil. Um, so evil Kirk suddenly is wandering the ship now and he's being very dramatic and very like confused and he's confusing other people on the ship as well. 
So then Scotty transports this dog-like creature that was on the planet to the ship and sees that it transports twice, a docile version and a vicious version of the dog, which is basically a dog with a, a horn plastered like a on top of it. unicorn costume on. <laughs> unicorn costume. Um, so finally, Scotty figures out that it's the ore dust that causes this to happen. And so until he fixes that, they can't transport the people who are still down the planet back to the ship because it'd be too dangerous. Um, and it's getting fatally cold there late at night. And Sulu is down there with some other crew members. So it's dangerous. We need to get them back up there soon. And a little side note, they don't have shuttles yet in the production of the show yet. So there isn't the option of sending down a shuttle because the writers haven't thought of that yet. And they don't have the okay, production. That takes care of one of my questions from, I got some questions. Yeah. <laughs> so basically later on the show, they develop shuttles and they have shuttles. And initially they didn't want shuttles at all because it was to be too expensive to um, film and shoot and have shuttles going down to the planet for every episode. So they invented the idea of transporters where it'd be like, oh, we'll just send them down the transporter. That's a lot cheaper than uh, shooting the, uh, the miniatures and stuff of having a shuttle go down the planet every episode. So that's why that was right. there. But eventually they figure out for some episodes we have to have a shuttle. It just makes logical sense and they factor that in. So meanwhile, the regular Kirk is actually a docile Kirk and he's very like timid and shy and he doesn't can't make um decisions and he's he's bad at making command decisions um and evil kirk makes his way to yeoman rand's quarters and he says you know we have a love for each other and then he assaults her basically trying to make her kiss him and everything and she fights him off and scratches him in the face so he has three scratches across his face now but he is seen by a crewman in the hallway so he runs after him and he attacks him before the crewman can report him to the uh the people um but Rand, meanwhile, reports this attack to Spock and Spock and Docile Kirk or Good Kirk, if you want to call him that. They order security yeah. to help capture this evil Kirk who has scratches on his face so you can recognize him. Um, evil Kirk finds makeup for his injury so he can hide it. And he attacks another crewman and takes his phaser and then goes hiding in engineering. Uh, Good Kirk figures that he would go to engineering, too. So he decides to find evil Kirk there. They have a bit of a fight. And then Spock disables the evil Kirk with the Vulcan nerve pinch, which is pretty much the first time we'll see this uh, in production, but not it was in the last episode, but that was actually filmed later. Right. In a different order. Right. right. And so this is actually the first time that this happens. And in the script originally, uh, they wanted Spock to punch him in the face or kind of chop him to knock him out. But he's like, the Vulcans wouldn't be that violent. So he comes up with the nerve pinch idea. That was actually in Leonard Nimoy's idea, hmm, uh, which okay. is pretty cool. He's like, yeah, Vulcans are more peaceful. They just be like, knock somebody out peacefully. Uh, so Spock notices that both both the Kirks are getting more and more fatigued. And in order to save them before they just, you know, die, they have to reverse a transporter accident. And also so that they can bring the people on the planet up before they freeze to death, which is important because Sulu's down there. And Sulu has a lot of funny moments during this time, making funny comments to to Kirk, like uh, trying to get back up to the ship. Send down some coffee and yeah, all sorts of fun. Exactly. Uh, so Spock and Scotty use the power from the impulse drive to try to reverse the transporter accident. They test it on the dog thing with the, the unicorn horn, and it works, but the dog dies shortly thereafter. So they continue to try working on it before they try it on a human. Um, in Sick Bay, Good Kirk uh, tries to convince Bad Kirk that they need to work together to combine again, and he seems to convince him, so he unbinds him, and then Bad Kirk attacks him. He goes to the bridge and then tells the crew to leave the planet orbit and abandon the crew there. Uh, but meanwhile, Bones, Spock, and Kirk, the good Kirk, make it back to the bridge in time to stop him. And bad Kirk starts lagging from exhaustion. He's just he's overtaken and he they're over, able to take him over to the transporter room and then reverse the accident. And so they get the regular Kirk back. They confirm that it's him and he's 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 on the level again. They save the crew on the planet. They bring them back. And then he thanks Spock and says, thanks from the both of us, meaning both his sides of his self, because it's the aggressive side and the docile side and the loving side together that make Captain Kirk who he is. So that's basically what happens. The enemy with I him. like I like that, that he followed that with like, he's gone now. Let's forget about him. With a line <laughs> embracing both sides and then another line that was like, nah, <laughs> forget that ever happened. Forget it ever happened. I learned nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a very troublesome uh, line from Spock at the very end where he says to Yeoman Rand, like, oh, but that evil Kirk had some good qualities, didn't he? And then Yeoman Rand looks at him horrified and then walks away and Spock smiles at her like weirdly. It's just very yeah. bad moment. Yeah. Um, and neither Gene Roddenberry or Richard Matheson, the writer of the episode, 
take credit for that that line saying mm. that each other wrote it because they're like it's just it's really bad it's it's really inappropriate as long as they know it's bad yeah it's just it's wrong <laughs> so <laughs> uh some trivia from this episode um some of this may be basic to your Star Trek fans out there, but I figure there's some new people out there who are just watching who enjoy Muppets but haven't seen Star Trek before, so you might not know some of this. Um, this is one of the few times in Star Trek uh, where you can see the middle finger is missing on James Doohan's hand, Scotty. Um, his middle finger is missing because he was actually in the D-Day invasion in 1944, and he lost his finger during that battle. So in some scenes, you can see Scotty holding a phaser and he's missing a finger. He lost it in D-Day, which is really awesome. Uh, another cool thing is that, uh, as I said, Richard Matheson wrote this episode. He is famous for writing uh, both the There's a Man in the Wing episode of The Twilight Zone, mm-hmm. uh, which also had William Shatner starring in it. But he also wrote I Am Legend, the book, which was uh, ah. late, yeah later on made into a movie with Will Smith. But originally it was going to be with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And that got canned and eventually it is a movie. great. It's not even a full length book. It's like a novella. It is great. Highly recommend. Oh, I am legend. It's very different than the movie. And it's a very good book. Um, Entirely different. He's like a factory worker. He's not some Jesus savior, <laughs> last scientist on earth. Yeah. And the cool he, thing is he's that a he's a guy who, who worked a factory line and he's the guy that all the vampires are scared of. I, I just look into it. It's, it's so fun. good. It's yeah. so good. Uh, petroleum yes. jelly was applied to William Shatner's face when evil Kirk was taking over. That was the way to look him sweat, <laughs> sweaty. Another cool thing that, in this episode is the director was Leo Penn, who was the father of Sean Penn, the actor. Oh, ah, okay. Very cool. Yeah. Just a, just a star studded kind of episode here. Um, yeah. So that's kind of like the cool stuff about this episode. It's a lot of firsts and a lot of, uh, star talent that were working on it behind the scenes. So it's a, it was, it's a good episode of star Trek, I think. A lot of hamming it up from Shatner, but otherwise good. Yeah. But uh, what'd you think of it, Steve? All right. So before I get into this, I just want to make it clear. I really did like this episode. Oh, good. Because I have a, I, I'm about to say a lot of critique kind of stuff, but I wanted to clear that I really did enjoy it. This is the most enjoyable episode for me so far. Nice. Some more nitpicking. I was stuff. a little sad that Hura wasn't around. Yes, she wasn't around. That is sad. Other than that, it was, it was, it was really good. I loved Unicorn Dog. <laughs> Anna loved Unicorn Dog. My daughter Joyce loved Unicorn oh, Dog. Did she? That's adorable. Uh, and I loved how evil Kirk was performed and portrayed. Nice. Re- really liked it. And and Shatner just went for it and sold it. And they kind of go back and forth. He's it. not necessarily evil. He's just super, super aggressive and, and id. I don't know. Yeah, but even at one point, one of them refers to him as evil. Yes, yeah, because he? <laughs> like, he tries to rape someone. He's, he's pretty freaking evil. <laughs> right, right, right. Like, let's just be, be reasonable here. He's evil. All right, so the things that I, I struggled with and maybe disliked a little bit, there was, and this is sort of a theme, I feel like there's an extreme lack of logic in the future. Okay. <laughs> just an extreme lack of logic. It seems like finding evil Kirk Shouldn't have been that difficult. <laughs> uh, like all, all they had to say was like, and they did, they announced it. Uh, Captain Kirk, there's an imposter on the, and they lock Kirk, real Kirk in a room. And they let the rest of the 400 some staff members find evil Kirk. Yeah, it's like, if you see Kirk, that's not him because he's in this room with us. <laughs> right. And he makes a stance. I was like, okay, good. They finally did something smart. They're going to go find him. And then Jim, where would you go? I'd probably go to engineering. And do they send a team? <laughs> of any of the guys who he assigned to go look for evil Kirk? No, him and Spock have to go themselves because they're idiots. Well, that's like an ongoing thing about they make fun of his Star Trek, the original series, especially is that they always send the captain and like the top officers of the ship to like away missions and, and dangerous things. It's like send the security team. <laughs> um, I had a lot in the once again, similar critique to previous episodes. I had a lot of confusion as to exactly what was happening with Kirk and doppelganger Kirk in that at various times it's mentioned that, uh, that real Kirk is becoming less and less able to command as his, his ability to command ekes away from him. Uh, but it's not like other Kirk became more and more aggressive. Yeah. He just came in, became more tired or something. Escal- escalating. If anything, evil Kirk got more and more in control. That's true. So where at the end, he was able to kind of fool the the yeoman and kind of fool, fool the bridge crew at first. And I I may be able to talk some of that up too. When they touch hands in the sick bay, it like 
transfers some of the power between the two of them. Uh, the one docile uh-huh. guy becomes more authoritative and then he becomes more calm, the evil one. So maybe that was part of it, but they didn't really explain that very well. I agree. Uh, and then there was a lot of inconsistency with the transporter that made it feel like just a really dumb limitation hmm. in that. Oh, it's not working. Oh, it's going to take a week to get back up. We found this other thing to run it, f- one, run it through, but it, so we can, we can try to reunite the dogs and they try it and the dogs die. And then literally the cutback from, from the commercial break is Spock, like the transporter is still being fixed, but we know it worked. They just did the thing with the dogs. Well, they're still trying to make, fix it to where it doesn't kill something. Right. But then my other question is, can't they send something down? Couldn't they send a blanket <laughs> down to Sulu and them? Or are they worried an evil version of a blanket will appear <laughs> after the first blanket they send down? You're quite right. Send down something to keep them warm. <laughs> right. Like, are they afraid that like uh, an evil radiator is going to show up? <laughs> If it's still warm, I don't think they're going to care that it's an evil it's like radiator. a blanket you put on yourself and it makes you colder. <laughs> right. So I just didn't, they're just that inconsistency of it's working, but it's kind of not working. But then here's my other problem is that uh, at the end, Kirk and Doppelganger Kirk climb in, he's hugging them and they, they let them, they make it, you know, they make it work. They reunite them. Kirk steps off the thing and immediately is like, get them off that planet. And then they just do it. Right, they don't test Which him means to make that sure. At the moment that Kirk was there, it was already fixed. Well, so why didn't they beam those guys up before they had they? Well, he was the first test, and once that worked for him, they're like, okay, now it's safe to beam them back up. I guess, but I didn't. I personally did not correlate them reuniting two people in some sort of terrible transporter accident with <laughs> oh, we can't use it for other things. Yeah, it wasn't explained the best way it could have been. So that, that was really, so mind you, I really did like this episode, but there were some inconsistencies that made me go, wait, what I, are, are they breaking their own rules? They just set. Yeah. Something to turn your mind off for, for this episode. Yeah. For sure. A little bit, but I loved evil Kirk. I loved evil Kirk. Oh, good. And honestly, I was blown away and this, not say it's something I liked, but I was surprised by, uh, was his near sexual assault of human Rand. Rand? Yeah. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Um, I expected them to cut away or play it soft, but they really went for it. Yeah, it was, it was intense. And like a really threatening way that I, I was surprised to see from 60s television just okay. in general. And then seeing her later, like broken down her hair, a mess and her makeup on her face. And she's like, she's a wreck. Like they didn't shy away from that either, which I thought was intense. Yeah. I, yes, I absolutely thought that that was, I'm not gonna say it was great. Right. That's like giving a thumbs up when someone says like their family member died on Facebook. Like it's a, that's not what I'm trying to do here. I'm just saying that it was it was surprising in in a good way. And it was kind of all ruined by that weird Spock moment at the end, but you know, not quite. Yeah, not quite. <laughs> uh but overall, great episode. Lots of fun. Oh good. I'm glad you liked it. So now we have uh similarities, I think. Yes, we do. Um so I just have like one long string of similarities that are all interconnected. Probably same, similar to mine, I would imagine. Oh, yeah. Both feature a doppelganger of the main character. Yep, I put that exact same thing. <laughs> who hits on a blonde cast member mm. and gets physically attacked by said blonde female cast member after violating her in some way. Yes. After which the real main character is blamed and held accountable for the doppelganger's actions. <laughs> that exact thing happens about these episodes. That was just too weird that there was a doppelganger of Kirk. I was the same episode. There's a doppelganger of Kirk. I was so happy, like <laughs> so incredibly happy that these lined up so perfectly. It's so weird. So weird. And so per- it just means that, that we were meant to do this German. Of course it's a, it's a harbinger. Uh, after that, I didn't bother to look for any other similarity. Well, I, I would say <laughs> one more so is that the first uh, dance sequence with Ruth Buzzy is her forcing her love onto Sweetums. That's right. And so there's another episode, a situation of forcing love on someone who does not want it. Okay, um, I can see that. Yeah, so those are another similarities that I put down. But it's 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 a theme of these two these two episodes that happen to run together a little too well. It's a little if weird. If anything, I was disappointed they didn't do more with Doppelgang or Kermit. Yeah, he only had a couple scenes in that, but the one key scene with with uh, 
Miss Piggy. And, and also I wanted to mention is it was a little disturbing to see Miss Piggy so in love with Kermit, which we're used to and, and is from watching the movies and like, oh, mm-hmm. she's loving Kermit. Finally, this is a starting trend. Uh, but then she immediately and then like the next sketch is making out with the other pig character. Yeah, well, this is when Piggy wasn't piggy all the time right yet she was only for some you know, sketches she was some sketches she wasn't yeah it, again at the dance it was done by richard hunt again where the two pigs are dancing together i it put that note in there i was like that does not sound like frank oz's voice suddenly and then later on in the episode it sounded like frank oz again yeah and then there's another character at one point that has the voice that is basically frank oz's miss piggy voice that is not miss piggy uh. Uh, another fun one uh the blue uh frackle mm-hmm that with the three legs, the voice is being done by Dave Goals, uh, who is basically doing an early version of Uncle Traveling Matt from uh, Fraggle Rock. Oh, is that the guy who's like the old man in the house? What? No, no, no. Oh. Uh, uncle Traveling Matt is Gobo Fraggle's uh, uncle who went out into the big outer space world, which is what they call the human world. And he sends back postcards to Gobo about weird things that hum- humans do. Well, that'll be uh, for Jarman in four years in the future when we're doing uh, Fraggle Rock on this on this uh, show. <laughs> Fraggle Rock and the Next Generation and or Voyager. Yes, exactly. <laughs> or D Space Nine. Um, great. I've got some good Trek connections. Oh, I'm excited. Oh man. So uh, Ruth Buzzy was on Laugh In for six years, seven years, something like that, and Leonard Nimoy appeared on Laugh In once or twice. Of oh, fucking course, it's always him too. All these connections is always him. <laughs> uh, Shatner hosted a show for the TV Guide Channel about uh, recapping the best sci-fi shows of all time, and one of them was Lost Saucer, featuring Ruth Buzzy and Jim gotcha. Neighbors, uh, and then. Buzzy and Kate Mulgrew oh. of Voyager both did guest voices on an animated show from the early 90s called Cowboys, <laughs> which was a show made in the wake of the extreme popularity of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, where they were just anthropomorphizing every animal they could get their <laughs> hands on. So it was about like law keeping cows. Wow. That's bad. <laughs> and both Buzzy and Mulgrew did voices on it. Well, good for Kate Mulgrew, Captain Janeway, getting some voice acting work. That's right. But oh no, Jarman, what's that noise? Oh, do you hear that? Ah, ah, ah! Transporter malfunction. Transporter malfunction. Now, I wonder if we have the same transporter malfunction this time as well. I'm going to have you Probably. go first. Uh, one note real quick. I really liked that the phrase transporter malfunction was used at least three or four times in this episode. Yeah, this is a heavy transporter malfunction episode. So many transporter malfunctions. <laughs> so my transporter malfunction was to have uh, evil Kirk go over to the Muppet show because I would have loved to watch him try what the doppelganger tried with Miss Piggy and have her just kick the living crap out of him. <laughs> he deserves it. Right, exactly. I think that would have been really good. Yeah, and I just basically had like basically Kirk and evil Kirk and then uh, Kermit and wind up Kermit transporting to the other episodes, both of them together, because uh, it would have played perfectly. <laughs> yeah, too, it really would have. It's, it's too right. weird. It's too weird that this happened. Um, but my other one was to have um, Miss Piggy and Miss and Yeoman Rand uh, t- trade places basically in a transporter malfunction. Uh, okay. So you basically have Miss Piggy pl- portraying Rand doing the same kind of thing that happened in the scene with her and wind up Kermit. Uh, and her just, you know, hi ya kicking the crap out of him. Yes, kicking the crap out of him. <laughs> uh, my, my other one was having the whole Go Go La La Jubilee Jug Band uh, transported over to the origin, uh, to Star Trek uh, and just have them be the group that's on the planet freezing to death. <laughs> that works. And every time they cut back to the planet, it's them singing, uh, You Can't Roller Skate in a Buffalo Herd, but like a little slower each time. Oh, then at the same a token, you could have the, uh, oh, what's the band that sings Sunny? Uh, oh, the Electric Mayhem. The Electric Mayhem could be just the people on the planet, sl- <laughs> instead of speeding up the song, slowing it down. Slowing it down. <laughs> Sunny. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, yeah, lots of, lots of good opportunity for transported malfunctions here. Yeah, that was great. 
So that really brings us to the end of episode five. Oh my God, five of the Muppet Trek That's podcast. Right. That's right. Join us next time for episode six of The Muppet Show with special guest star Paul Williams. And original series episode of Star Trek, Mud's Women. So, from the lovers, the dreamers, and us. Live long and prosper, everyone. Thanks for listening to The Muppet Trek Podcast. Be sure to follow us on social media on Facebook and Twitter. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. This podcast has been brought to you by A Play on Nerds. <laughs>